Welcome back to the Stories of Northern Life podcast from the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. I'm your host, Nicole, and today I am going to be talking to you about the fur trade here in Sault Ste. Marie. Now, before we begin, I just want to please ask you to like this episode, leave a review, share it with your friends and family so that we can keep boosting our podcast in the algorithm so more people can find it and we know that you are loving this podcast. So just before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the Sault Ste. Marie Museum is in the Robertson-Huron Treaty Territory of 1850, and that it is the traditional home of the Anishinaabe. Sault Ste. Marie was originally named Bawading, and Bawading is the home of the Batuana First Nations, Garden River First Nations, and the historic Sault Ste. Marie Métis Council. The Ojibwe people were the first ones to settle here and establish their home here. They called this place Bawading and were living here for probably thousands of years before Europeans even stepped foot on Canadian soil. Now, the French were the first Europeans recorded in this area. They were led by Etienne Brule, who first arrived in the area around 1618. He was sent here by Samuel de Champlain, and he arrived here, met the people, got to know them, and he went back and he told Samuel de Champlain of all his adventures. So he was sent back with his one friend or partner or whatever, um, Grenoble. Grenoble and Brule returned here in 1622. And it was at that point that a time Brule renamed Bouwading So de Gaston after the brother of the French king at the time, and so referring to the rapids. So, so is um, literally translated as jump or leap, but if it is, say, talking about water, it's when water makes a jump or a leap, Um, and so this is referring to the rapids making that drop. And now I also talked about this in my episode with Anna Jameson as she also talked about the rapids. So in 1642, the first Jesuits arrived here in this area. In 1665, it saw the arrival of Father Alouez, who proposed a permanent mission be built. And now Father Marquette constructed the mission in 1668 on the South Shore, which is in present-day America, because the North Shore, the Canadian side, was a little bit more marshy or um, swampy or whatever you want to call it. However, there are some notes from other people passing through the area that were noting that most of the Ojibwe people actually lived on the North Shore. So that could have also perhaps been why the Jesuits decided to set up on the South Shore because there weren't as many Indigenous people set up on the South Shore. So I guess they felt that they could use that area a little bit more. And it was also at this time in 1668 that Father Marquette changed the name of the area once again to Sceau de Saint-Marie. So the uh, rapids of St. Mary, St. Mary, you know, being the Virgin Mary. And this name would later evolve into Sault Ste. Marie. It seems that Pretty soon after he renamed the area, people were referring to it just as So Saint Marie. Just easier to write on maps, I guess, easier to refer to. And it just kept evolving until we got 
the soup. Now, Radisson and Grosselier were two French fur traders who were operating without a license, and they were charged by the government of New France, and their goods were confiscated. So they petitioned both the government of New France and France, but to no avail. So they then decided to seek compensation from the British government. And the British eager to get a better foothold in the North American fur trade and obtain knowledge of French trade routes, uh, while King Charles II of England granted them a charter to form the Hudson's Bay Fur Trading Company in 1670. And so it seems that as a response, the French king, Louis XIV, fearing that the British would then take their territory ordered Simon François Dumont, Seigneur de saint luçon or just saint luçon uh, to take possession of the area around the St. Mary's Rapids. On June 4th, 1671, in the pageant of saint luçon the land was formally claimed for France. In 1671, the French mission burned down, and a second one was built in 1647. The second mission was then destroyed after a, quote, indigenous war. It was reconstructed once again. Then, in 1689, the mission was abandoned due to the advancement of the Iroquois and the increasing fear of conflict between them and the Ojibwe. Around this time, the other Europeans retreated from the area, and upon the return, there was a focus on the fur trade and commerce. In 1750, to secure the area and provide shelter and food for the French voyageurs, King Henry V granted Chevalier de Repensigny land on the south shore to build a post with a farm. He was also charged with destroying trade alliances between the British and the Indigenous peoples. In 1751, Fort Repentigny was finished, and he called it Fort Sauvage. Jean Cadot was also hired to manage the farm. In 1762, there was mounting tension between the English and French. British troops occupied Fort Repentigny, but a fire at the fort made them withdraw to Mackinac. A year later, in 1763, with the Treaty of Paris, France ceded New France to Great Britain. Alexander Henry, upon hearing that the Sault Ste. Marie territory now belonged to the English, traveled to the area to begin trading. He moved into Fort Repigny and made Jean Gadot his partner. Several independent fur traders were operating in this area. The competition was severe, which led to increasing prices of fur. Fraud and lawlessness were evident. Alexander Henry and the Frobisher brothers saw cooperation as better than competition. They formed an association in 1775, and in 1779, the Northwest Company was formed. In 1783, the Northwest Company established a post on the south shore of the St. Mary's River in the old French fort, Fort Repigny. The Treaty of Paris in 1783 established the border between British North America, or present-day Canada, and the newly formed United States of America. Jay's Treaty of 1794 addressed the outstanding issues of the Treaty of Paris 1783. The British still occupied American territory, and they were given two years to hand over the land. So, in 1796, the Northwest Fur Trading Company post moved to the North Shore in accordance with Jay's Treaty. After this, British subjects lived on the North Side and Americans on the South Side. In the first 24 years, most residents of the North Shore were Métis families working for the Northwest Company. And as I said before, the Canadian shore was low and swampy, probably why everyone had previously settled on the South Shore, but politics had forced them to then live on the North Shore. In 1797, the Northwest Fur Trading Company built a canal or bateau lock. 
It eliminated the need to portage, which cut down the strain on the voyagers as they did not have to carry heavy 90-pound packs, items, and the canoe itself from the Lake Superior shore to the St. Mary's River and vice versa. It also cut down on the travel time as no detour was needed. It was a 2,580 foot canal with a wooden path alongside that was used by ox to pull the boats. Four men were employed at the post to run the water-powered sawmill with two saws on the south side of the canal. A number of Sioux-based voyagers served as crew for these canoes. So here is a report from Captain Breuer's on September 10th, 1802. He states, The landing is in a heavy bay immediately at the bottom of the fall on the nearest channel to the land of the North Shore. A good wharf for boats is built as the landing, on which a storehouse 60 feet long and 30 feet wide is erected. Close to the store, a lock is constructed for boats and canoes, being 38 feet long and 8 feet and 9 inches wide. The lower gate let down by a windlass, the upper has two folding gates with a sluice. The water rises 9 feet in the lock chamber. A road raised and planked 12 feet wide for cattle extends the whole length of the trough. The canal begins at the head of it which is a channel cleared of rocks and the projecting points excavated to admit the passage of canoes and boats. This canal is about 2,580 feet in length. And here is a quote from George Harriet, who described the Northwest Company Post in 1807 in his book, Travels Through the Canadas. The factory is situated at the foot of the Cascade of St. Mary on the north side and consists of storehouses, a saw, and a bateau yard. The sawmill supplies with planks, boards, and spars all the posts on Lake Superior and particularly Pine Point, which is nine miles from thence, has a dockyard for constructing vessels, and is the residence of a regular master builder with several artificers. At the factory, there is a good canal with a lock at the lower entrance and a causeway for dragging up the bateau and canoes. The vessels of Lake Superior approach the head of the canal where there is a wharf. Those of Lake Huron to the lower end of the Cascade. The company has lately caused a good road to be made along which their merchandise is transported on the wheeled carriages from the lower part of the Cascades to the depots. The houses are constructed of squared timber clapboards and have a neat appearance. The Northwest Company Post was vital to Sault Ste. Marie, with their entire business coming down from Lake Superior and traveling through the St. Mary's Rapids and then on to Montreal. This was their only passage between the East and West and one of the most important posts used for repacking and the distribution of supplies. The lock built in this area was a very important feature as it saved men much time and effort. From Lake Superior, Sault Ste. Marie provided access to Montreal via the French River or Lake Simcoe and St. Lawrence River, Detroit and Niagara via Lake Huron and Lake Erie, the Lower Mississippi River via Lake Michigan and Illinois River the Upper Mississippi River via Green Bay and Wisconsin Rivers. During the War of 1812, two American gunboats were dispatched to intercept British aid at Fort Michilimackinac. They were too late, so instead they decided to burn Fort St. Joseph, then Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. 150 American troops, led by Major Holmes, burned the Northwest Company Post and the surrounding village on the North Shore on July 22, 1814. The British then burned the President's house in retaliation. The Americans built a new house, which they painted white, and this is now the White House. Mr. McGillivray visited the Sioux on July 30th, 1814, and noted the ruins of the building and sawmill were, quote, still smoking. Nothing was heard of the canal until 1889, when the lock, covered in debris, was discovered. 
it was, quote, thoroughly wrecked, but timber sufficiently preserved to permit the old canal and lock to be pretty well reconstructed. And Francis Hector Clark helped to reconstruct the lock in the same exact place and dimensions, and it still stands there today. If you go over to the canal district and you look right next to the conservatory building, you can see the Northwest Company lock still proudly there. In 1819, the Northwest Company rebuilt their post. One building that they reconstructed was the powder magazine, which later became the base of the blockhouse. The blockhouse was the home of Mr. Clark, so he could oversee his industries. This building was built out of cut field stone, and today it now stands proudly beside the Ermatinger Old Stone House. In 1821, the long feud between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company was over as they merged under the Hudson's Bay Company name, and the Hudson's Bay Company constructed new buildings at the fur trading post. However, after the amalgamation, Sioux State Marie started to lose its importance in the fur trade. The canoe brigades that used to travel westward in the spring, then eastward in the fall, no longer passed through the rapids. Goods were now transported via the northern Hudson's Bay Company routes. The fur trade was heavily centered around the beaver, which European hat makers used to make the popular beaver felt top hats, but the silk hat replaced it in 1840, reducing the need for beaver furs and the need for the fur trade. However, at this point, the beaver was already an endangered species. We have reports from June 1843 that show the Hudson's Bay Company post here in the Sioux was just a provision depot as there was scarcely any fur trade. As reports are not clear, it cannot be said with certainty, but it was said that the Hudson's Bay Company closed the fur trading post and moved the retail store to a new location. The indigenous and Métis communities who worked for the fur trade remained in a section of the city called Frenchtown in the West End. Other reports show that the Hudson's Bay Company post closed for good in the Sioux in 1867, but also on May 31st, 1900, or in 1904. So again, we're not exactly sure on the dates that the post officially closed, even it just being a sort of provision post. However, we do know that the original Hudson's Bay or Northwest Company post that was rebuilt in 1819 was abandoned for some time when Francis Hector Clark purchased the property and remarked on the abandoned post. He redesigned the powder magazine into his home that was made to look like blockhouses of the old frontier forts, hence the name The Blockhouse. So there is our episode for this week. I hope you enjoyed our story on the fur trade here in Sault Ste. Marie. And next week, I think we might be talking about the Old Stone House. Another building that was here during that time and also played a little part in the War of 1812. Stay tuned for next week's episode and thanks for listening. Have you been to your local museum lately? Visit us at the Sault Ste. Marie Museum, located in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, the one with the big clock tower on the top. Our hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday to Saturday. We have three floors of exhibits that we constantly work on updating. The whole family is welcome, as we have activity sheets and scavenger hunts with prizes for every kiddo, a discovery gallery full of hands-on learning, and more interactive elements scattered throughout the museum. And don't forget to come say hi and let us know you're a listener of the podcast. Hi, I'm JL Fazell, and I write and publish poetry inspired by nature and the art of being human. These are some of my words. 
I love sitting next to the water. It's one of my favorite peace places. So this poem is from my third book, North of Dreams, and it's called The Movement of Water. There is calmness to be found in the waves. There is something about their relentlessness. Whether they are gentle or fierce, they never stop moving. They never give up their pursuit of kissing each inch of the earth. I hope that this poem took you somewhere inside yourself that you needed to go. You can listen to my story here on the Stories of Northern Life podcast. Links are in the show notes.